give me a signal. Uh, let's see, so my name is Brian Shirai. I started here at Unova last month, and I, I still live in Portland, but I'm coming here very soon. Uh, and so I have met some of you, I haven't met all of you. I would certainly enjoy meeting everyone. Uh, this is going to be short, about 20 minutes, and we're going to have time to discuss and talk and ask questions. If something is really burning up your curiosity, please interrupt. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So the title of this is Communicating with Ruby. And by that I mean sort of two senses, communicating with Ruby, like we write Ruby code, and that's how we communicate with each other uh, on the applications we're creating. And we also use Ruby code to talk to the computer. So to tell the computer what to do, we use Ruby code. So using these two senses of communicating, uh, it reminds me of a, a thing that I read from Kent Beck's, uh, one of Kent, Kent Beck's book, and it's not a revolutionary idea, but uh, Kent Beck said that when he's writing code, he thinks about the fact that he has two audiences. He has other developers, including his future self, that's going to look at that code probably someday, and the computer that he's trying to tell, do something, and hopefully do it correctly or the way that you want it done. So when I think about communicating, and I think about uh, the way that we as people communicate, it's not much like programming. Uh, if I am telling you a story, I might mix up uh, a detail, or I might uh, say, uh, you know, use the wrong word. There's a lot of stuff that's actually a dialogue that goes back and forth, and this is really apparent. So I'm moving here. I needed to get my electricity and gas and uh, internet all set up. So I go to a website, and I start you know, trying to find who uh, I can, what company, you know, is the, the electric company, let's say. And then I start putting in my information, like my address, and the unit number is 302B on my lease, but no company in Chicago knows what unit 302B is for this address. They're all listed as B302. So after a couple of those, I think, like, okay, I got this. Got to the gas company, and they don't even have any address, but the gas is on it in the unit. So I talk to a representative, and we go through the process of, of communicating, essentially dialoguing back and forth, trying to, to work out what is, um, what's wrong with this address that I'm giving them because they can't pull it up. And what do I need to do? I need to get a meter number or, or a previous bill that has an account number or something. So if I think about that experience compared to how I normally am interacting with my computer, they're radically different, right? So this idea on the one hand kind of makes sense that we're communicating using something like Ruby with each other and with our computer. But at the same time, it's very, very different than the experience that we have communicating with one another. And what I'm curious about is whether or not we can bring those two closer together or whether we're just fooling ourselves by suggesting that we're actually communicating using something like source code. So at this point, I want to give you a, a task. So this is a survey, but it's not. I don't want anyone to raise their hand. I want you to think about this. If this is how you feel generally as you're writing Ruby code. <laughs> I want you to note that. So to make that a little more explicit, it might be something like this. Just changing one small thing takes too long and often breaks something else. If this is something that is predominantly your experience using Ruby code, and you feel like this is your internal you know, face, just note that. I want, I, want to, I want to come back to that. I want you to think about that as we're going through this. If you're more like this, this face is actually called a sleeping face, not that you're just like sleeping through your job, but if you're just sort of like, yeah, I can use Ruby, but I can use other things, and actually Ruby doesn't give me that much stuff, that's not a bad thing. Maybe maybe that's just the perspective you have. But if this is your internal face, then just you know move that. And then finally, if this is your you know your experience and basically you maybe say something like this to yourself, I can easily add new features, you know, um, my application and I don't have a lot of problems, then that's your interesting. So take a moment, figure out which one of those that you are or, or predominantly are, and then we're going to dive into a little bit of code. So Ruby is a really simple language in many ways. Now, that's also not true. It's a very complex language, but it has syntax that allows us to express things very, very easily. I have some collection, I iterate over it, and I do some operation. And typically, this is what we deal with when we're talking about Ruby code. We just see source code. Uh, 
uh, we communicate by you know, writing classes and, and methods, and then when we get to talking about something like a new loan application, we switch completely to some other, other language. But Ruby itself is very, very simple, and I think that one of the interesting things to think about is whether or not we can bring some of this simple way that we describe things to some of our other discussions. What I want to do here is actually take us behind the simple code and start looking at something else. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at this object that we have in this called compiled code. And our focus right now is to look at how we're writing Ruby code to communicate to the machine. And later we're going to come back and look at how we're writing Ruby code, that, uh, things that we can actually do that may help us dialogue with one another and talk about what the code is doing instead of just, I'm trying to tell the computer to do something. So compiled code, what is that? Compiled code is an object that exists in Rubinius. Um, I guess I shouldn't assume, does everyone here know that Rubinius is a Ruby implementation? I've been giving a lot of presentations and I forget that that's the case. So Rubinius is a Ruby implementation. We are trying to be compatible with MRI, and right now we're trying to be compatible with Ruby 2.1, which was just recently released. Uh, we have some work to do there, and we were compatible with 187 for a long time, which is a really good thing for Nova because we have a lot of code that runs 187. Whether or not you're using 2.1 or 187, all the things I'm going to tell you about right now apply. So it's something that's kind of cool than us. All the effort that was put into making 1.9 and 2.0 and 2.1 to make it really be better um, conflated the language with the implementation. And what we actually have in Rubinius is a fairly superficial syntax layer for 187 and 1.9 or 2.0 or 2.1. And the underneath, the technology underneath, the stuff we're going to talk about here is actually just a, just a point to keep in mind. So we have a com we have a command to compile the Ruby source code into something that the computer can run, and this is a command that you can use. So RBX compile. I'm giving it a dash capital B flag because that's going to output byte to me, and I'm telling it to only show me the methods that are named M and I'm giving it a dash E, which you should be familiar with this Ruby uh, command line. I'm saying, here's the code that I want to evaluate. And then I gave it some Ruby code. Def M, there's my method. And it has that little snippet of code that we had in the before. And what it produces is, <coughs> this is a representation of the compiled code object. It's not the object itself, obviously, but it's sort of like a pretty print of the object. And I'm just going to go through a few of the pieces of this compiled code object. One of the things, I think we'll see OK. One of the things that we have in here is uh, an accurate representation of all the arguments that are passed. In this case, there's only one required argument. In here, yeah, this M A is not in it. But if there were other arguments, you would see that there. Uh, it tells you what local variables are in this method. So that's something you can easily see. And then this particular thing is an interesting piece of a compiled period object. It's called a literals tuple. And it's essentially a vector of things in your code. Right here we see this compiled code, and we'll get into what that is. And then it's each, if we go back to our source code, each is a method in here, but in your source code it's actually a literal name. Right? So we need to be able to send each me uh, message to that object in A, and when we compile that, the each itself is a literal symbol in that, in that source code. So the literals tuple contains some, some uh, pretty useful information about the contents of the method. Now the compiled code uh, in here, so we're looking at a compiled code, and then there's another compiled code in that. And if you think about that for a minute, you might realize that there is another thing that's like a method in here, but we don't typically think of them like methods, and that's the block. The block is another execution context, right? So one of the things about Rubinius, the way Rubinius looks at Ruby, is that everything that could execute code is actually a compiled code object. The body of the block, the body of the method, the body of the class or module, and even the script context that you might you know, throw together to run, they're all compiled code objects. So what this gives us is a uniform view from, from the sort of inside of Rubinius of what Ruby code looks like. Any Ruby code that you execute is a compiled code object. It has a bunch of information, including this mapping of line numbers to uh, 
to instruction pointer addresses in a way. So basically we see here the decompiled bytecode and we see the numbers go from zero to seven. And this is telling you that there's a line uh, from zero to seven is line two. So inside the compiled code object, we've taken the Ruby syntax and broken it down into a bunch of pieces that we can actually use. So very simple code and then a very different representation. How many people here who have ever have ever seen something like this for Ruby code? Something that's not just the Ruby syntax that you write. I knew Kurt was going to this. So not that many people. Very simple. Okay. So if we look, remember we have the compiled code uh, right here. That compiled code in the literal is tuple for the, the method M. And then we have we recognize that that's a block. And here we can see that there, there's the block. There's one local variable. There's one argument. There's one literal, the plus symbol. And if you look back here, we can see that that all makes sense. So blocks have arguments just like methods. They have local variables just like methods. And they have operations like this in the inside. So without delving really deep, one of the really interesting things about Ruby is, and, and one of the things that I think is something that we here can leverage a lot, is that our just-in-time compiler, our bytecode version machine, uh, the garbage collector, they know literally nothing about Ruby syntax. By the time that the, the Rubinius system is doing stuff, the compiler has just generated a bunch of this stuff, and that's what it operates on. And so that's the case for actually any language that you can target with Ruby. So, so you could actually write a different language that's not Ruby, commit the same bytecode that just in compiler, the bytecode which machine can all operate on. And one of the things that we can do with the just in time compiler, because these, these things are all represented uniformly like this, these compiled code objects, the just in time compiler, when it's actually looking at putting all this stuff together and generating machine code that can run, it can take those things and compose them pretty much any way that it wants to. There's certain restrictions, of course, but it can do things like inline that block into that method, or inline the plus into the block. Put all that stuff together in the generation. So that was a really, really fast, really, really fast look at just some of the basic things underneath uh, Rubinius that enable us to do some pretty powerful stuff. The, the just-in-time compiler is something that only basically JRuby Rubinius and Topaz have right now. Topaz is very early, and hopefully they'll continue. They're basically using the PyPy technology to implement Ruby. Uh, JRuby, of course, is using the JVM and uh, the Java sort of, sort of uh, JIT underneath there. They generate JVM bytecode, and then we have this in the um, Now to switch just a little bit to, we're going to continue to look at that compiled code object, but we're going to look at it from a, a different perspective. And I've thrown that method inside of a class, and it, you can see that it takes the collection object A. So we're basically looking at the same code. The interesting thing that we want to see is what happens when you do when you operate on that uh, that thing that we pass in. So when we look at Ruby code, we tend to see you know just this. And some people, especially if you come from a static typing background, you're like, man. I really wish I knew what this thing was going to do because I, I can't see from the code right now what that object A could be. So how could we find that out? Well, before we were just using the RawBX compile tool, now I'm in R IRB and I'm going to get my hands on that compiled code object again. So I created the object of that class A and I'm going to create a, uh, I'm going to get a hand, my hands on the compiled code object by basically grabbing the method out of the object. So object is an instance, O is an instance of A. And I'm going to say CC, the compiled code object is O.method M. I want to get the, the method from it. I'm going to grab the executable. The executable is the thing that Rubinius has underneath there. The compiled code object is, is put in this executable attribute. Uh, once I have my hands on that, I can start doing some interesting things. Literals is just another Ruby object. I can grab, I can hit the literals uh, to clear. I can grab the first uh, object out of it, which is that compiled code instance for the block. And I'm going to call the method. I'm going to pass the method an array, so a collection object. And it has two different kinds of objects. It has a 
a string object and a fixed one. So I call the method. So when I call the method a dot each, so it went over those the string and the array and it passed each of them to the block and then it called the plus method. Plus is one of those things that we have in Ruby that you can't really tell. Was that a string or was that a, uh, an array that did plus? Was it a number that did plus? So what if we wanted to find out? So we called it. Now, I grab the block uh, period object here. So from the literal sample. There's an attribute on compile period objects called call sites. So I'm going to grab the call site for that block, right? that's going to be the plus method. And what I get back is a polymorphic inline cache. So since I called, since I passed to M, this collection that had two different kinds in it, and plus was called in both of those, at that call site, we saw two different things. And if we go into those, in, to that inline cache object, and we look at those instances in that polymorphic inline cache, we can look at things like the receiver class, which is not surprising, it's string. Okay? The stored module, that's where the, the method was actually found. If I made a subclass of string and redefined plus, I might see uh, sh my subclass and the method here. If I made a, made a subclass and did not redefine plus, I would see my subclass as the receiver class and the method itself was actually found in the string class. And I can see how many times I, I actually visited that, like how many times that call site executed. So I have a ton of information about that movie code that initially looks really difficult, let's say, to analyze and to understand. And all I had to do was run it one time to get all the information. So uh, receiver class, receiver class, and then I have even some more information. I have the uh, instruction pointer address for what that that call site is actually at, and I have the location of the source code that it was at. And if I look at, it said it was on IP4, so if I look at 4, sure enough, I see it's sending a message plus uh, with one argument, which is exactly what we're looking at here. So back to this view, uh, what can we do with that? One of, the, one of the first tools I think that we're going to work on is to create a production ready, like, to meaning it does not impact performance in production, coverage tool. Since we didn't do anything extra, we didn't add tracing, we didn't add some other events, we need to do all those things anyway to run the Ruby code. We need to keep track of that information and make it legit more powerful. Because we have all that information, we could actually pull this information out of production. And then when you're looking at this code and you're wondering what object was an A or you know, what types of objects were in A, we should be able to present that information. So <coughs> using that, we should be able to communicate with one another about code because we're not depending on some comments here. Only pass me an array, or only pass me something that has strings in it, which is not going to work out very well over time. And when we go into code that we don't understand very well, we're going to be able to see a lot more about how that code actually works than what we can see from this. So on the one hand, Ruby is really concise, and I think it's a beautiful language. I've been working on Rubinius for over seven years, uh, basically with these sorts of goals in mind, knowing that we could bring much better technology to Ruby. That you know, and the, the thing to realize here as well is that this isn't something that we made up. This is technology that exists in the world and is used in other systems in the same language. So while I really love the how I think simple and concise Ruby code looks. I understand that there are lots of challenges when we get to an application this big. And so what we hope to do is start creating tools that will address a lot of those things. So back to your sort of inner, inner person. What, what I basically want to say at the beginning, and I, and I forgot, was that I was hoping, depending on which one of these that you were, I was hoping that I would change your mind. And I, and I want you to think about whether I did. If you're pretty sad with the Ruby code that you have to write now, I hope maybe that you've moved more towards the happy side of the spectrum because there are things that we can do to make some of those pain points go away. Um, if you were really happy before, I hope that you're a little dissatisfied now that even though you've been happy using the Ruby code, there were really powerful tools that you could have had at your disposal that you didn't. Hopefully we'll have those now. I hope that 
I've shown a little bit of discontent for people who are pretty happy with Ruby because I think we can take Ruby far, far further than it has been. And if you're in the middle and you're still asleep, uh, that's okay. Uh, give me feedback about what sort of things didn't actually impress you and, and what might. Because there are, like I said, this is a very, very simple introduction and there are lots more things that we need to do. So that's all I have. So thank you very much.